So thank you so much for joining us for climate change and global development net zero after COVID-19. This is the seventh in a series of Yale's development dialogues, which are virtual panel discussions hosted by the Yale Economic Growth Center, the South Asian Studies Council, and the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. And as you may know, if you've joined us in the past, we look to lessons from history and economics to address today's policy problems in low and middle income countries. I'm Catherine Cheney. I'm a journalist focused on global development, and I'll be your moderator today. And I'm joined by panelists, including Sir Dieter Helm, who's Professor of Economic Policy at the University of Oxford and former independent chair of the UK's Natural Capital Committee, which provides advice to the government on the sustainable use of natural capital. Plus, you'll hear from Rohini Pandey, Sunil Amrith, and Rory Stewart, who are organizers and co-hosts of this series, and I'll introduce them in just a moment. But first, just to set up the topic, uh, the topic of green growth has come up a few times over the course of the Yale Development Dialogues, and there's been some debate around it, but we haven't really tackled this head on, and that's what we'll be doing today. So in climate negotiations, low-income countries have long asserted that they are being asked to sacrifice economic development for a problem that's largely caused by high-income countries. And today, Western countries set bold emissions targets, even as they continue to import goods manufactured in low and middle income countries at a high environmental cost. So countries like India may in fact increase their reliance on coal to help mitigate the economic devastation caused by the coronavirus pandemic, which of course has really become a crisis in India today, even as they set targets for renewable energy production. I should note that this dialogue is being held on Yale Climate Day, which is a full day of virtual events, this provides an opportunity for the Yale community and the public to come together around pressing environmental challenges. And you can click the link in the chat if you're joining us on Zoom for details on other events today, including John Kerry's keynote this afternoon. As I mentioned, as people were still signing on, for those of you joining us here on Zoom, please do submit your questions throughout using the chat or Q&A function. And now I wanna go ahead and introduce our panelists and move into discussion. So uh, earlier I mentioned Dieter Helm, his most recent book, Net Zero, How We Stop Causing Climate Change, addresses the actions we all need to take to tackle the climate emergency, and we'll hear more from him on that. Uh, Sunil Amrith is the Renu and Anand Dewan Professor of History and current chair of the South Asian Studies Council at Yale. His research focuses on histories of environment, migration, and public health across South and Southeast Asia. Rohini Pandey is the he Henry J. Hines II Professor of Economics and Director of the Economic Growth Center at Yale. Her research has examined the political economy of aid and empowerment of the poor in developing countries. And Rory Stewart is a former member of parliament and secretary of state for international development in the UK. He's written extensively about travel, politics and development and argued against the merging of the Department for International Development and the Foreign Office, now known as uh, the FCDO, you may be familiar. So I wanna begin with a question for each of you just to get your take on the topic we're addressing today and then we can dive into details of what you have to say and get into a conversation. But I think we all agree, we might not agree on the path to this, but I think we all agree that the traditional methods of growth must change in order to address climate and development goals. So the question is, and this is where there might be some disagreement and debate, what are some of the hard decisions that need to be made and who needs to step up? So just to get your take on this topic, um, let's begin with Dieter, if that's all right. Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for asking me along to this discussion. So almost all discussions about environmental concerns start with the question of the economy and economic growth. And um, the alternative is put forward as either green growth or no growth. Club of Rome thought that we should have no growth at all. My take on this is that uh, growth is perfectly plausible, uh, provided it's driven by uh, technology and ideas, and that the scope for the advancement of human ingenuity of technology is enormous. However, we can only consume at a level which is consistent with sustaining those opportunities through time. So the fundamental environmental observation to kick off with is we are all living beyond our sustainable environmental means. In other words, we are consuming too much and the level of our consumption has to adjust down before it can continue to go up uh, into the future. And why is that? It's because you and me are ultimately the polluters and we are not paying the cost of our pollution, including carbon emissions and the like. And whether those emissions are caused in India 
or China or Africa or they're uh, uh, caused in London is irrelevant in the climate change example. So we have to step up and pay the costs of our pollution and recognize that we're responsible for far more pollution than we're currently causing. And that leads to some pretty hard decisions because of course, politicians around the world from Biden to Johnson to uh, von der Leyen in the EU are all promising to boost consumption to solve our current economic difficulties from the coronavirus. And simply boosting consumption is not a model which is going to uh, deliver the kinds of environmental adjustments that need to be made. We, the polluters, have to adjust down, and then we have a proper level to work on with. But the politics of that are extremely hard. Thank you. And when you mentioned we're all living beyond our sustainable environmental means, I know your book outlines some steps that can be taken, which we'll get into in our conversation. Um, but I'd love to go ahead and bring um, let's see, we'll begin with Sunil, if that's all right. Um, we'll bring Sunil into this. So uh, again, I mentioned that you and Rohini and Rory have been um, part of conversations over the course of this series where the topic of green growth has come up. Um, and I wonder if you can expand on, uh, ba based on maybe a historical perspective as well, which I know you bring to this, um, what do we do now that we're at this crossroads? Who needs to step up? What hard decisions need to be made? In some ways, Catherine, I think the hardest decision is um, the way you put it just now, you said, you know, we all agree. Uh, we all agree, but I suspect a lot of the world does not agree. Um, and I think that the hardest task is in fact a, a profoundly political task. And that is the task for those of us who believe that uh, a new way of thinking about growth and the relationship between the economy and the environment is necessary. The task is one of, of persuasion, really, because I, I don't think, um, I think there's a big disconnect between the kinds of conversations that we've been having on this dialogue uh, with, with a wonderful audience engaging with us um, and the conversations that are being had um, around the world, not just in the developed countries, but also in developing countries about um, who should sacrifice about what priorities are, particularly in light of this pandemic. I think you're absolutely right. And so if that is a barrier, um, persuasion, which I think it is, uh, hopefully in our conversation, we can get to in not only hard decisions that need to be made, but hard steps that need to be taken, including persuasion and consensus um, before we can actually make progress. So hopefully we can get into that. Um, Rohini, can I bring you into this? What's your take on this topic um, and net zero after COVID-19? How do we get there? Thanks, Catherine. Um, so I think I'd probably build off both what Dieter and Sunil were talking about and kind of re really remind us that in some ways before there was economics, there was political economy. Um, and that really, I think, is what needs to be center stage as we think about issues to do with climate change and how we are going to get rich and poor countries to possibly choose different distributional burdens. Sunil talked about uh, persuasion. I would add to it um, the idea of how do we create incentives? So how do we actually have policies that incentivize rich countries to do what is uh, arguably uh, good for the world, but perhaps may not be good for them in some very narrow sense, something I know you're going to come back to that we've already seen with COVID-19 and a lot of discussion of vaccine nationalism. The other issue I'd bring up is that of implementation. I think a lot of discussions of climate change policies tend to be quite legal right now. So uh, there's a lot of discussion of having different countries decide how to, you know, what policies to put in place. But when we look at, I think, the, the failure of several of these uh, policies, for instance, those of the Kyoto Protocol, a lot of them have to do, again, with weak institutions that make it hard to implement these policies. And again, looking at COVID-19 and looking, for instance, at the vaccine rollout in India and how slow it is, I think it's important to remember that a lot of the issues are going to be, you know, how do we have fair technology transfers? How do we, you know, think about IP issues? But a lot are going to also be about how can, um, how can the global community help strengthen institutions and how can citizens of domestic countries ask for the institutions that will give them the voice they need? And yeah, I know you can expand on this in our conversation, but I think um, if we look at COVID-19 as a test for how um, developed countries can support uh, developing countries going through a shared challenge, um, it, there are concerning implications for our ability to respond to climate change. 
um, given, given the challenges we've seen with COVID-19 and, and global solidarity in responding to that. Um, Rory, I'd love to bring you into this. I know that your views on these issues um, include uh, your own experience as working in policy, working in development, trying to uh, work with countries facing these hard decisions. So um, what, are, what are some of the challenges ahead and, and who needs to do what? Well, I'm really gonna come in on this from the point of view of somebody who was recently a, a politician and a minister. And I, I saw three different types of issue. One of them is domestic to Britain. So when I was running to be mayor of London, uh, all the polling suggested that the overwhelming majority of the population was not prepared to spend 15 pounds more a year in order to pursue environmental policies. So it's extremely important to understand that domestic politicians running are being told by their polling experts and strategists that this is not a way to get votes. And if you think about the things that we wanted to do even at a tiny scale in London, for example, on air quality, extend the clean air zone out to the outskirts of London, which was going to impose a cost of 65 pounds a week on people with older vehicles from low income families. Um, you could see why very, very quickly in the election, um, people were reluctant to go there. Um, but that's the first thing. Right? Second thing is the way in which countries like Britain deal with other countries, in other words, the bilateral relationship. So I was very struck and differed by the enormous reluctance from British development professionals to really emphasize uh, climate. And the reason for that is that their development models very much depended particularly on energy. So a lot of the programs that they were most proud of and which they thought would get the greatest results in terms of getting people out of poverty uh, involved investing in coal-fired, heavy oil fired plants. And when push came to shove, when I started to block those projects, so I started to block money going to a shale oil project um, in Senegal, for example, or I tried to stop the Commonwealth Development Corporation spending its money on large fossil fuel burning projects in Africa, there was huge pushback, enormous reluctance, even though the development community acknowledges that a lot of the impacts of climate change will be felt very, very drastically by some of the poorest people in the world in terms of flooding, in terms of soil erosion, in terms of heat. Right? And the argument made to me by the most senior person, Diffid, is that by dealing with climate change, we were punishing today's poor for the sake of tomorrow's poor. And then the final uh, point, which we can turn back to, which I think you know, Rohini, Sunil, and Dieter have all touched on, is the way that this is actually perceived from other countries and how much uh, you know, India may be reluctant to accept these type of moves. But to take it even more extreme, think about Afghanistan. When I walked across Afghanistan in the winter of 2001, 2002, there was literally no electricity between Harass and Kabul, none at all. Right? And as Afghanistan tries to develop, obviously they're trying to generate some electricity, but this is a country of 30 million people. If Afghanistan began to go on the path of trying to generate the amount of electricity that a European country of 30 million people got, and that that was repeated, because you cannot imagine the scale of a problem we're creating for the world. And yet, can you imagine trying to say to Afghans, no, 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 I'm sorry, you know, this isn't going to happen. Okay, so on those three points, I'm going to stop because everybody else was much shorter than me. Well, I do have one follow-up question for you, which is when you, you're facing that kind of pushback and that statement, as you said, by dealing with climate change, we're punishing today's poor for tomorrow's poor. Um, there's also, you know, there it's hard to make change, right? Even just institutionally, no matter the change, it's hard to make change. And you mentioned that these energy projects, which um, within DFID, there were a lot of champions for these energy projects in terms of their development outcomes the environmental impacts were um, negative. If you're making that kind of argument and seeing that kind of pushback, it seems that it would be helpful to point to examples of what could work. And can you give some examples? What could work? What, what could be a win-win yeah. for development and for the environment? So, 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 I mean, it is true that you can do some extraordinary renewable energy projects now, uh, much more cheaply than you were able to a few years ago, right? So. I went to see this extraordinary uh, wind project in Lake Turkana in Kenya, and I went to see some extraordinary solar projects in Jordan. 
and they are generating electricity in Jordan from solar panels at an incredibly low rate. Um, but I just want to dig into that a little bit because of course one forgets how politics matters even with something like a solar panel. So although they were generating electricity from these solar panels much more cheaply than they were generating electricity from anything else, they weren't building anymore. And the reason they weren't building anymore was politics. The Arab Spring had led to them losing their fuel supply from Egypt. They had then signed a series of contracts for 20 or 30 years with big international uh, oil companies to produce carbon produced energy into Jordan. And they couldn't get out of those contracts. They had to pay the money to them every year regardless. But there was no point in them building more solar panels for domestic consumption. And they couldn't export because all their export lines run through Syria to Turkey and Iraq, which had a huge demand for the type of power they were able to produce. So I, I just wanted to bring that to bear because it's very tempting for students and others to think, okay, well, why don't we just carpet Niger with solar panels or Mali with solar panels or Jordan with solar panels? But when you actually get into these problems, the way the contracts work and the way that the politics and conflicts in neighboring states work, these things become much more difficult. I'm sorry, I'll try to be a bit more optimistic in my next answer. <laughs> no, that's great, Rory. Um, and I want to bring Rohini in because India came up earlier. And just in terms of zooming in on, on what this looks like and how politics are involved, as Rory mentioned. Um, Rohini, can you can you provide us some perspective looking at India? Well, I've seen the train pass through from outside my house. Uh, Bad timing with the train passing through, okay. But let me jump. Actually, I wanted to just uh, follow up on uh, Rory's point on uh, solar pricing and actually talk about some work that one of our colleagues here at Yale, uh, Nicholas Ryan, has been doing right now on um, solar, um, solar pricing and solar uh, growth of solar energy in India. And I think the point he's made is that, you know, green energy suppliers now increasingly have, as Rory said, low, um, what we would call variable costs, but they still have a large fixed cost. This is partly the case also that as you're thinking about alternative forms of energy, we often have to think about how they're going to fit into the grid. So what this has meant in the case of India, which is a federal country, that if you're a producer of say, um, you know, you're a green energy supplier, you have to contract with the state government in order to say, I will give you so much solar energy that will go into your grid. But what, what this means is that most electricity distribution companies, which are state level in India, are perennially bankrupt for a combination of political economy and other reasons. And so there's a huge concern of basically renegotiation and default by these state electricity companies, which will very often you know, not be taken to court the same way. And so this has led to, in general, quite a lot of uh, counterparty risk for green energy suppliers when they're trying to go to the state government. So they're very willing uh, in Nick's work right now to sell to the central government, which seems to be doing better here, but very unwilling very often to go to those states that are actually the poorest states that are just about beginning to put in place grids, where you really want from the start a transition to green energy. But those are exactly the states where the suppliers don't want to go in because they're the most concerned that they will not be able to recover their cost. So I think that's a good example of saying that very often we look at technology and we say, wow, look at the price of solar, it's falling so fast. But we have to actually think about, you know, what actually is it going to take for these suppliers to provide it? As Rory said, sometimes it's international, but even within, you know, a, a fast growing country like India, you know, it can be institutional barriers or just, or just risk that means people won't enter. Absolutely. I write a lot about uh, technology and global development, and there is a lot of promise um, when it comes to technology in this space, but that what will it take question, um, many barriers stand in the way. And, and speaking of that, I want to return to Dieter now and hear a little bit more about your book and, and what you lay out um, in the book. And I know you, you, you talk about what citizens and governments can do to cut carbon and um, you know, we've heard a little bit from Rory about some of the challenges working in government. Um, Rohini expanded on that. I'd love to narrow the focus to citizens for a moment, because earlier you were talking about this as a shared responsibility. Um, and for citizens in low and middle income countries in particular, I'm curious, um, kind of building on, on Rory's point earlier, what should they be asked to give up? Um, and, and, you know, um, again, many challenges here in terms of uh, asking people to do things for the environment that might not be in their own self-interest um, or in the interest of their country from a development perspective. 
Um, but I'd love for you to expand on points in your book in terms of if we are all to take action, what does that action look like from the perspective of citizens in low and middle income countries? And you're on mute. Yeah. <laughs> Get used to the Zoom lock in the end, you know, after a year. Um, uh, it's important if you ask citizens to do things, and I deliberately focus on citizens and not just consumers, um, and I'll explain that point in a moment, you have to make sure that what they're doing is going to make some difference. And it's actually going to address the problem. So you have to start back at the beginning with characterizing what the climate problem is, where it is, and what would be necessary to crack this problem. So the first thing to say is almost all the discussion is about emissions. But the number that matters is the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere, the stock and the other greenhouse gases. It's sequestration and emissions, and it's emissions net of sequestration, which adds to that concentration. So it's just as important to talk about what's happening to the Amazon and how you protect the natural assets around the world as it is to talk about what comes out of a coal power station. It's not that the coal power station is important, it's just that we shouldn't be exclusively focused on emissions without thinking about sequestration. So things like rainforests in, in uh, Brazil, it's both. It's emitting a hell of a lot by burning it down, but it should be sequestrating a lot instead, and oceans, uh, uh, phytoplankton, and so on. So that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is anyone who thinks one more heave, and that'll I'm sure lead to our discussion about COP26, has to explain how a bit of recent history um, doesn't fit that model. So every single year since 1990, we've added two parts per million to the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere. There isn't a blip for the financial crisis in 07, 08, and there was no blip last year during the lockdowns. And that should really give people pause for thought. If you do all of that to the developed economies and still you add two parts per million to the atmosphere, you know, we really have to look at this problem very hard. And I just don't, I mean, I'm happy for everyone to have meet up for 17,000 people to rock up in, in Glasgow. I'm very pleased that politicians are talking about climate change, but anyone thinks that Paris really cracked the problem and this is the icing on the cake, they're not in the same universe as me. Now, the next thing that's very important, and this is back to which citizens, okay? If you look at current climate change, nearly 30% of emissions are from China, okay? China has more emissions than Europe and the United States put together now in the share of total emissions. These are staggering numbers, okay? And what's more, it's building more new coal power stations than all the coal power stations closing in Europe and in America. Good that that is, it's important to put this in proportion. And at the current growth rate of China, at say five to 6%, by 235, there'll be two Chinas. So, to get a real grip of the magnitude of the problem, think about a world in which you just go offshore from the east coast of China, and there's another one, and it looks very much like the existing one. And that will probably be true of India too, as India's growth rate goes back up to five, six and beyond. And you can just do the arithmetic. So these are stunning numbers. So if you go into that context and say, so what does it take to crack that problem? Well, if you just look at emissions, you think it's the Chinese, it's all their fault. I've heard politicians you know, say those things privately going forward, okay? So there are two things to say about it. One is that a lot of those emissions are for you and me. So the Chinese model is less so now, but was built on an export orientated model as an Indian model may be going forward, following on from Korea, Japan, and Germany in the periods after the post second world war period. So you have to make sure that the people who are actually causing those emissions to be made actually are the people who are paying for those emissions. The piece I'd add on top of that is that if you think climate change is going to get solved between now and 250 or beyond, then it's almost not all, but largely going to be in terms of additional contributions to climate change going to be coming from China, India, and Africa, and Brazil, uh, Philippines, Indonesia. These are the rapidly area, uh, growing areas of the world. And if they do rapidly grow with high, level, high levels of emission, whatever the justice of that, 
we will face that very hot climate change. So if we are really interested in making these changes, we, the citizens of the countries with much higher consumption per head, have to make sure we pay for the emissions in those countries. And now what do their citizens do? Well, I'd put it the other way around. What are their citizens entitled to? So I say citizens because in my environmental approach, what I want to do is to make sure that all citizens have the basic capabilities to function in society. You can see that I did my thesis under a March Ascend to see where this argument comes from. So it's a positive entitlement to assets, not utility, not the economist's normal currency. It's making sure they have the wherewithal within which to live their lives. And the most important wherewithal to do that is to have the natural capital assets, the environmental assets, to make their lives tolerable. And the only way that's going to happen, as the Ind Indian Energy Minister made clear a couple of weeks ago, uh, is that there has to be substantial transfers to make that possible. And I think the most frightening thing about Paris and in the discussions about Glasgow is that people are talking about, well, couldn't we go from 100 billion to 200 billion to address the transfers that might be required? You know, we in Britain spent 300 billion just on COVID, right? <laughs> this is an order of magnitude different. And the difference between the COVID episode and the climate change one is the COVID one enables an element of national wall building and uh, nationalistic protection, which we've seen let loose. There is no wall you can build, not even one that Mr. Trump could imagine, which will keep a ton of carbon emitted anywhere out of the world into our climate. So I think we have to think about global citizens and their entitlements we have to think about it in assets, not flows, and we have to think about it in the capabilities that go with that, not just trying to make them happy and think it's some utilitarian exercise in maximizing economic welfare. Thank you, and I, I'm glad you brought up this point around natural capital, which I hope we can return to, because I think too often it's presented as a trade-off in terms of you know, protecting the planet um, at a cost to your country's development path, but when you bring in natural capital as a lens through which to look at this, um, you can identify more of these win-win opportunities. One very quick comeback on that. Please. There are a lot of people who think there's a trade-off between the environment and economic growth, between mm -hmm. natural capital and GDP tomorrow, okay? And at the same breath, they'll accept that what we're currently doing is unsustainable. Mm -hmm. So the conclusion that follows from something that's unsustainable is it will not be sustained. And the problem is, and the problem of convincing people in Europe and the United States is that the people who are really gonna get the brunt end of it not being sustained is actually not us. We've got a lot of technologies, we've got air conditioning, we've got all sorts of things. It's the poor that get the consequence. And that's what makes the politics nasty because it says, actually, you know what? If we don't do what's necessary to address climate change, we get the effects last they get them first. And that sequencing is quite important. That's really well just, put. Go ahead, Rory. Come in very quickly. I mean, I think, you know, Dieter's produced a very stark and very important thing there. Um, remember, it's also true to some extent within uh, wealthy countries that it's often the poorest people who are at the center of this political problem. So if you think of relatively straightforward policies that British governments tried to implement, for example, we tried to increase fuel tax. There was an escalator set up where the fuel tax was meant to go up every year. That was stopped. Um, the Labour Party campaigned very strongly on trying to control energy prices. Be because the people that increasingly uh, are the focus of political activity right, could be the Rust Belt in the United States, could be the Red Wall voters in Britain and in Northeast Britain. Um, are often people who already feel that their incomes have stagnated, that there is extraordinary inequality, that they are really struggling to get by, and that basic things like running their car or heating their house are taking a very large amount of their income. So many of the most straightforward policies that we would want to pursue will have an impact on them. And, and that's gonna also relate to something at the heart of Dieter's proposal. Dieter essentially is proposing that there is a tax on our consuming of these products. 
products, right? So um, the more products that we consume made in China, the more that we would pay. Um, but of course, the people who will feel that most are the people that are driving a lot of the political discontent and are defining a lot of the politics uh, in Europe and the United States. Thank you. Thank you. And on this point about, um, you know, I think Rory, you teed it up nicely. It's not just about um, rich versus poor countries. It's about poverty and inequality within countries. I know that's something Rohini can speak to. Do you want to jump in on this? I'll just briefly jump in and, you know, maybe also be a little bit more provocative. Um, you know, I think we can only go so far if we think of this in terms of geography and countries, because in the end, you know, there are many people in countries like India and Brazil and even China who are really not consuming very much. And it may be that at the country level, that's where the costs are. But we have to recognize that, you know, consumption of the poorest is still something that needs to rise a lot. One recent thing I saw that was interesting was a few years ago, uh, Branko Milanovic had very had made very uh, well known this um, elephant curve talking about global income inequality. I recently saw an Oxfam report that had what they called the dinosaur graph, similarly showing how emissions varied by income, and you know showed that basically a lot of if you if you try to do emission um, counting not at the level of countries, but at the level of individuals, you see the same pattern that the, it's the rich who are really consuming a lot. So I think one thing we need to start thinking hard about when we think of these cuts is not to have all the discussion at the country level, but move it down to, again, what I think is happening in the income space, thinking about wealth tax or inequality tax. And so one final point just to think about there is, you know, we need to start thinking about corporations and companies just as you think about wealth tax. So for instance, very often I talked about how solar providers are finding it hard to enter Indian states. Nick actually has earlier papers showing how fossil fuel companies tend to enter these 30 year contracts uh, with states and then renegotiate them. So there are going to be many cases where just as I think in the inequality, income inequality space, there's now a very robust discussion about the need for wealth, wealth tax in the US on kind of corporate taxation in the UK. We need to start thinking about in the environmental space at the level of what we think are the large individuals and corporations that are emitting, not make it just about countries. So I want to bring Sunil in here with a historical perspective. India has come up a few times. And as I mentioned earlier, and as many of you are following, I'm sure, um, as this country faces the second wave of COVID-19, it's a real crisis. And um, Sunil, over the course of this series, you and other historians have linked um, different examples of South Asian history to current policy decisions. And I wonder if you can speak to whether it comes to um, responding to COVID, emerging from COVID, um, and, and tackling um, this issue of climate, making these hard decisions. What are examples from India's past that might inform policy decisions that need to be made now? I mean, it increasingly seems to me that what we need in, in India is is in a sense nothing short of the kind of foundational conversations that were had in the middle of the 20th century, which many of my colleagues have been working on. Um, the sense of that conversation in the mid 40s to the late 40s when the fundamental questions were asked, you know, what sort of polity, what sort of society, what sort of economy is this going to be? Um, I'm not optimistic that political conditions are, are particularly propitious for that kind of conversation, but I am struck by how much of the unfinished business of that earlier moment we are now dealing with. So that was a transformative moment. Um, the universal franchise was introduced in a country with profound levels of social and economic inequality, which many people at the time said would be impossible. Um, one of the things that did not happen in the 1940s, and there's a very, very interesting uh, graduate student at Harvard called Kiran Kumba, who's working on this at the moment. One of the things that did not happen was nothing was done to address the chronic underinvestment in public health that had been a characteristic of the colonial state in India. And throughout 20th century and into this century, India spends a smaller proportion of GDP on health than just about any country in the world. We're seeing the consequences of that now. And I mean, in some sense, one of my puzzles, and this has been true for many, many years, is why health has never really been a political issue in India. Um, not uh, at the state level, yes, from time to time, but never, it's not something that wins elections, 
And this is something that goes back to what Rory was saying earlier about, you know, the citizens of London voting for their mayor um, were not perhaps willing to spend even 15 pounds um, to address environmental questions. This is a much more puzzling question because health affects everybody. It affects the poorest most. Um, and this has not been a, a topic, at least maybe until now, for, for massive mobilization. Um, the other connection that I want to make in terms of India it goes to something that, that Dita was saying. This is very interesting. So the Lancet found that in 2019, air pollution was responsible for 1.6 million deaths in India. Um, the year before that, nearly as many. Uh, we're talking, you know, over two or three years in India, um, as, as many people die from air pollution as have died through this terrible global pandemic on, on a global scale. It, it, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that air pollution has not received nearly as much media attention or provoked as much anxiety or concern uh, as this pandemic. So I think this um, goes to what Dita was saying about, you know, there's, there are no walls we can build in terms of, of carbon emissions, for example, um, unlike perhaps some of what we've seen with the pandemic. Um, so, so there are questions. I'm not sure there are lessons from Indian um, history, but more sort of unfinished business that we need to sort of return to the fundamental, going to what Rohini was saying, institutional questions, political questions about, you know, how to prioritize public health. And from there to think about public health in a way that goes beyond the emergency of COVID to the ways, the causes of air pollution, for example, are far more aligned with what we're talking about in relation to the climate crisis and energy consumption. Catherine, can I just very quickly say that, I mean, I think there's something very important in Sunil's conversation about that foundational moment in the 1940s and 50s in India, because it's impossible to get around the fact that there is an ethical dimension to this, mm -hmm. that ultimately in order to make our way through this mm -hmm. is going to involve some very, very dramatic element of sacrifice, transformation and difficult political choices. And Somewhere hovering underneath the surface of this conversation is the fact that actually what Dieter and Rahini have explained is the impossibility of generating massive increases in consumption and controlling climate change, which means that in the end, our societies, our politics have to find a way of talking about morality, mm -hmm. even though as a politician, you know, I'm very, very conscious of how easy that is to say and how very difficult that is to pull into an election campaign. Let me just, sorry, I'm uh, jumping in a lot, but let me just jump in on one thing that Rory said. Uh, the, I think the implications it also has for policy, and I'd love to hear uh, detail on this. We often as economists talk a lot about the most efficient policy. So for instance, we talk about carbon tax. I think Rory very clearly pointed out why something like a carbon tax on fuel through fuel tax may not work. And so this suggests that even as we start designing policies, I think we need to think a lot more about distributional and fairness issues as part of this ethical issue, which for instance, may suggest that sometimes rationing, which we think of as quite an inefficient policy, may actually be one that is you know, perceived as fairer and we should get to it. So you know, economists quite often talk about uh, what they would call second best policies, uh, but they often think of second best because there is some market missing. I think we might need to think about that what are the best environmental policies that need to take into account kind of issues of ethics or morality of distribution and may look quite different from what I think a lot of economists right now are pushing as sort of the technocratically best policies like carbon tax. Great point. Like, quickly, I'll just say we have a lot of questions coming in on exactly this, like what policies should we yeah. see moving forward? So this is great. Go ahead, Dieter. Um, so so I, I, I very much agree. But there's ethics at the heart of this. And, and the way I kind of uh, encapsulate that is you have to work out how future citizens are going to have a seat at the table. And they're going to have a seat at the table either because we haven't made the sacrifices and their seat at the table is to make the sacrifices, or we're going to take into account their interests going forward. And my uh, argument that we should ensure that each, in, each citizen inherits a set of assets natural assets at least as good as they inherited is an ethical principle but i also want to pick up this point that rory raised about fuel taxes etc and this link to to carbon pricing okay so it's very interesting as i understand it mr biden doesn't want to put up fuel taxes either 
And it's very, it's very, it's not just a kind of UK thing or a particular political party thing. You know, you tell the public, you know what? It's, it's better than a, a free lunch. You know, the climate change, we're going to solve it because it isn't going to cost much of GDP. It's all going to happen. The cost of renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels. You know, it's like the 20 pound notes lying on the ground and we just got to pick them up. And it may actually be GDP positive. OK, and I said to, to myself, is this likely? To which my answer is absolutely no, unfortunately. Um, is it likely that we can transfer from an overwhelmingly carbon intensive economy to one that isn't carbon intensive economy within 30 years? No. Nope. And therefore you get to this political, what I call in inverted commas, lie, which is tell them we're going to do, do it and tell them it isn't going to cost anything. Mr. Johnson put this in Biden's summit uh, a couple of weeks ago saying um, that he was going to have cakeism. You could have your cake and eat it too. That's morally irresponsible, right? And we will have to increase the price and we can either do it of carbon, either directly by having a carbon price. And we do in Europe, we do in the UK, actually most people have carbon prices because they have energy taxes in some form or another. Or we can do it implicitly. We can say, we're not gonna take the most efficient route because we don't like the politics of it. So let's find a route that's less efficient. Well, the answer to that is it's gonna cost you even more than the first route did. Okay, so I don't think carbon pricing is impossible. It exists. Uh, harmonizing energy taxes will get us a long way towards it. But the bit about carbon pricing that I really want is the border adjustment so that we don't pretend amongst the developed countries that when we reduce our carbon territorial production to net zero, we're going to stop causing climate change. UK is 80% services. We have no large energy intensive industries left. We pride ourselves of being the leading country in the world in reducing emissions. This is the way to go, guys, right? And actually, the truth is our carbon consumption is displacing our carbon production. It's very much higher. And that's because we're just not paying for our true carbon footprint. And paying for your true carbon footprint is at the base of any moral or ethical approach to climate change here and anywhere else. And since we're doing most of the consuming, and by the way, we put up 80% of the stuff in the atmosphere that's already up there. It's natural that it's our consumption in the developed countries that has to come first in this equation and not to tackle that by telling people well, you don't have to have a higher fuel price. You don't have to uh, pay for higher gasoline. It's not going to cost you anything. It's just delusional. And the consequence will be that we will have that climate change. And then back to the early point of the discussion, the people who are really going to suffer are in developing countries, some in developing countries too, in developed countries too. But remember, compared with, as witnessed in the Indian case with COVID at the moment, compared with uh, some of the developing countries, even the less well off in the developed countries have some kind of safety net, which unfortunately doesn't exist for most of the world's population. Very true. I, I want to bring in some questions from the audience, and um, we have some great ones coming in. And I'd remind you all, please use the Q&A function on Zoom, if you're joining us on Zoom, to submit those. Um, there is a question related to technology. And I think we, we kind of started with um, technology as a given. Like, we, we have the technologies, and so it's about persuasion and incentives and hard choices. But a question on that technology. Um, so won't global adaptation to green energy only happen when cost effective and dependable technologies make that adaptation desirable without being forced by government policies? In that regard, isn't, isn't research into critical obstacles like energy storage and safe nuclear the most important thing to focus on now? So I appreciate the question because again, we kind of just plowed through the technology point and this um, forces us to return to that question, you know, what more do we need on the technology front, even as we're tackling all these other issues in terms of uh, incentives and ethics and um, persuasion? Any thoughts on technology? Can I have a go? Please. Um, I mean, I said technology right at the beginning. The reason why economic growth is possible is because technology is pushing out. And um, uh, aside from uh, Robert Barrow's book, uh, actually, the evidence is that the speed of technical progress has never been greater. And this really matters for climate change, not just for the emissions, but the sequestration too. So 25% of global emissions at least come from agriculture. 
Soil on average has four times the carbon of the atmosphere. That's the biggest stock of carbons below our feet. And agriculture rips that out pretty quickly, especially, unfortunately, in some of the developing countries. If you look at what's going on in genetics, if you look at what's going on in gene editing, if you look at the transformation that digital information has created for agriculture, that's a revolution it's making. When it comes to the energy side, there is, of course, great technical progress. The problem is that almost all the hope and aspirations are placed on two decentralized, low energy density technologies, which cannot in themselves produce the kind of power required for the economy of the world as it is at the moment, let alone what's coming. And I'm talking about wind and solar. Solar, by the way, is much more promising than wind. You, know, you need a lot of wind turbines and a lot of backup and a lot of batteries and a lot of storage, and all that's important. But I think it's delusional to think that we're going to solve climate change with wind turbines and solar panels alone. We need quite a lot more. And that requires an honest discussion about technology. First of all, the enormous resources that ought to go into genuine R&D, which is a fantastically on average good uh, investment for, public, uh, for publics to make, even if the, the chances of each one succeeding is quite small. And we have to make some choices about whether we're really prepared to do this, and I'm not advocating we should, without big scale, energy as well as small scale, and that means hydrogen, nuclear, and things of that sort. And we're not there yet, but we will not crack climate change unless we have both the technology and the adjustment of the consumption frame. Neither of them will do it on their own. On their own. Thank you, and thanks for that great question. Any, any uh, other panelists want to jump in on technology? Otherwise, we have other questions coming. Go ahead, Rohini. Yeah, I just had one quick thing, which, uh, you know, it reminds me a bit of um, sort of the focus in the West Coast, for instance, on a lot of uh, tech driven for um, development policy. I think 10 years ago, this was the thing that we were going to just send, you know, phone on mobile, money on mobile phones, and that was going to solve all the problems of redistribution. And I think one thing we discovered is it didn't get the whole way there, not because mobile phones are not an amazing good or that we, that sending money didn't help people, but you know, there were countries that the regulatory agency said they didn't want to allow for mobile money because they were worried about risk to their banking system and so on. So I think my only note of caution is I completely agree with Dieter that we need, I think, significant R&D, but I think we shouldn't do it at the expense of thinking that that technology, uh, you need to think about, you know, what, how are regulators going to react to it? Are they going to be willing to put it in? And you know, even technology can cause trade-offs between short-term, as Rory described, you know, poverty reduction measures and longer run returns. So you may have a great technology, but what it might ask a country to do in the short run may make it politically very tractable. And I think if we could start having those conversations or even think about them at the time when you're financing technology, I think we could learn a lot from at least what hasn't worked, I think, in development policy, despite great technological advances. There's another question here related to the private sector. Um, and I'm loving these questions because they're all very action oriented, the role of technology, the role of the private sector. And I'll just preview in a moment, the role of universities. Um, there's a question around that, which I, I think would be fascinating for this group to take on. But let's talk about the private sector. So the question is uh, almost a thousand companies have signed on to the science-based targets initiative, pledging to set emissions reduction targets consistent with the Paris trajectory. Um, along with major companies setting similar carbon neutrality goals. So in what ways can these ambitious, ambitious targets in private enterprise help support and even spur governments to step up their own commitments? Can the private sector help lead the way? Does it play a meaningful role? Thoughts on that? Rohini? Yeah, I can jump in. I mean, I think, I think it's great. I think it's great to see voluntary efforts, but I think we should think about kind of the hard questions at the heart of this. For a lot of companies, really taking climate change hard, uh, climate change seriously is about losing money, right? If you are a fossil fuel company, there is no way that this is actually good news for you. So we have to recognize that while voluntary actions will get us some of the way, it's not going to be the, the only way in which private sector needs to be moved. Sometimes you do need the state to come in as the regulator, uh, you know, pushing private companies to take actions that they won't want to. I think there's one other thing to bear in mind also that um, it's very easy for companies to announce they're going to be net zero by a certain date. It's quite another when you look behind the bonnet what they actually think they're going to do. 
And there are two parts to that. First of all, remember, companies don't exist for the fun of being companies. They exist to sell stuff to you and me. So when companies pollute, the customer who buys the product is actually the ultimate polluter. Uh, and this is facilitated. So we, we castigate oil companies, but we go and fill up the car with petrol or diesel. Right? You can't have it both ways. You've got to put it in the frame. But the bit I just want to illustrate is a lot of companies say, well, you know, we're, 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 we're investing in trying to get emissions out of our production plant. But you know what? We've done a load of offsets. And you really have to look very hard at what constitutes an offset. And it looks like nearly half of what companies are claiming to be their net zero path uh, um, uh, is actually just buying into renewables projects, many of which would have to happen anyway. You have to be very careful. This isn't the religious version of buying indulgences. You know, let me go on doing what I'm doing, but I'll pay a side payment to try to exploit myself. Now, it doesn't in any way detract from the need for companies to take this stuff seriously. But I think this cascade of people declaring themselves net zero needs just a little bit of cautious and critical examination. Agreed. And I'd throw out uh, as a journalist, that journalism plays an important role there, not just um, featuring the announcements, but asking, you know, what's actually happening. Um, Rory, did you want to jump in on this question? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that sort of just to sort of step back, the, um, the, the fundamentals that we keep coming back to, which I think everybody keeps emphasizing, is that if the scale of the problem is as large as we're pointing out, and the forms of sacrifice required are that extreme, and it's extremely unlikely that you're going to be able to do this without a very significant impact on growth, consumption, et cetera. It's intuitively very, very unlikely that private companies are going to be able to, to lead this for all the reasons that Dietrich and Rohini have laid out. Thank you. I want to um, actually directly ask this question around universities, especially because we are um, you know, wrapping up for this academic year, the Yale Development Dialogues. Um, so the question is, what is the role of our universities in this whole process as knowledge and as dialogue um, with the world? So um, I think that's a, that's a good point. Why, why are we having this conversation and, and what more can universities do um, in terms of, of helping to carve the path forward? Rory, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, well, let me come in quickly as the one person who really isn't entitled to speak about this at all, given that I've got three <laughs> distinguished professors on the call. Um, but for me, as somebody who was a politician until very recently, and I'm now at a university, it is unbelievably refreshing and valuable to be able to have these types of conversation. I mean, the last 45 minutes of conversation simply doesn't happen in politics for 10,000 reasons to do with the way that elections work, the attention deficit of politicians, the general muggy thinking. Um, if one were able to take simply the last 45 minutes of conversation and actually embed it in the way that Biden or Boris Johnson or Macron thinks about the world, right, it makes the most extraordinary difference. And, and that's the, you know, that's why, for me at least, uh, universities are incredibly useful because it allows you to say things which are totally brutal. Because I can also assure you, as an ex working politician, there are at least six things that everybody said which would ruin their political careers in the last 45 minutes. I love it. Thank you, Rory. Do others want to jump in on this, the role of universities? I guess a question for me is how do we pull these kinds of conversations into the halls of government, into um, the heads of policymakers as they're navigating these hard it's decisions? Both ways, both ways round, isn't it? I mean, you know, give you an example, just uh, a few hundred yards from here, um, uh, a group of scientists got hold of the um, genetic um, frame map of the coronavirus and within just over a week had invented a vaccine. Uh, you don't get that anywhere else because you don't get that independent long-term research. And you know, the ultimate driver of economic growth and actually the ultimate driver of hope to address climate change is ideas. And ideas are not always produced in universities, but it's damn hard to drive them forward without universities and without engaging with the next generation who are going to inherit this planet and hopefully with a few more natural capital assets than we're currently on course to leave them. Sunil, go ahead. A few things. Um, in terms of that interface between these kinds of discussions and, and you know, the world of policy, 
my main source of optimism in general is, is our students. I mean, I think they are the main conduit between the kinds of conversations that we can have in the classroom. And, you know, many of them will go on to be journalists and politicians and, and policymakers. And so I, that for me remains the single most important thing that universities do is, is, is the teaching um, as well as our research, of course. Um, as someone in the humanities, I've been involved with a lot of conversations with so many of my colleagues about how we fold a climate change completely into what we do, not, not as a sort of just another topic that we study, but you know, how do we rethink the humanities um, with the climate con uh, crisis sort of very foremost of our consciousness? I think there are a lot of conversations happening around that. But the last thing I want to say about universities and climate change, um, picking up on many things that have been said in this conversation is we need some honesty about that too. I'm not sure that universities um, pay for their carbon footprints. Um, I'm not sure, uh, particularly universities like Yale and, and others with very large endowments um, have fully thought through um, the responsibilities on that side of things. Thank you, Sunil. And we just have a few minutes left. So I wanna close with one question and I'm sorry um, for those great questions we weren't able to get to, um, a lot of good questions coming in, but COP26 has come up a few times and um, you know some of our panelists have discussed that we have these meetings, you know, commitments are made. And yet, um, as Dieter mentioned earlier, emissions continue. Like we start to lose uh, hope in the process. Um, so with COP26 around the corner, taking place in the context of COVID-19, um, we only have about 30 seconds or so from each of you, but what's one thing you want to see happen? What, what could rich and poor countries do between now and November, or I should broaden it since we talked about it, it's not just a matter of geography. What should citizens do between now and November? Whether it's citizens, whether it's policymakers, what's one thing you want to see to improve the prospects for real progress to be made at COP26? And maybe we'll we'll start with our co-hosts and then conclude with Dieter, if that's all right. Um, Rohini, can I begin with you? Sure. Um, you know, this is also trying to just pick up on one of the questions in the in the in the in the Q and A. I think one thing we didn't touch upon, and I think it's going to be critical that we start seeing honest conversations on is the idea of carbon capture and storage. I think most models of growth right now that try to be sustainable are built on large amounts of sequestration of CCS happening. We don't understand anything about, the, I think, <laughs> of the economics of it, how it's going to be achieved, how will this happen? My concern is in something like COP26, that can become the big thing that everyone says, we will do a lot more carbon capture and sequestration but you know, this is not realistic at all. So I think having kind of more honest conversations on that would be very valuable. Thank you. I'll go to Rory next, if that's all right. Um, I, I think COP22 is really the opportunity for politicians to do something that politicians, particularly in an age of populism, find very difficult, which is to get away from cakeism, get away from having your cake and being able to eat it and focusing instead on detail and uncomfortable truths. And if there's one message that you want to try to get, it is that what we will have to do is going to have an impact on our growth and consumption. If you can just get that single message through and suggest to people that there will be pain and there will be sacrifice involved, that's probably the most important beginning for this conversation. Great point, thank you. Sunil. In honest conversations seem to be the theme of our conversation now, and I think that that is what is needed. Um, you know, I, I think as a humanist, I think narrative matters. And what I would like to see citizens and scholars and activists do is, is to find a way of linking what we've all been through with this coronavirus pandemic with a much longer term future. And the fact that the climate crisis and the coronavirus crisis are connected in many, many ways. And we've been uh, deeply conscious of one of these crises and willfully ignoring the other for the most part. Um, so I would like to see um, you know, stories, narratives, ways of linking these things in ways that are meaningful to people. Absolutely agree with you. Dieter, we'll close with your thoughts on, on what needs to happen between now and COP26 for this to really make a meaningful difference. Well, I think that uh, whereas the politicians are all uh, queuing up to make announcements about numbers, many of which they don't understand, and I'm not against that process, I would like um, the concentration to be shining the torch on what's really going on. I would like uh, a reconnection between natural capital, biodiversity and climate change. This is a global environmental crisis, not just a climate one. I would like the accounting done properly. So we measure who is really responsible for carbon. 
I'd obviously like carbon pricing because I want the polluters to pay. Uh, and finally, I think what I'd like individuals to do, citizens to do, is write their own carbon diary and look very hard into their own lives and write down how much during the average day they think is the carbon emissions that they are responsible through their consumption and ask themselves how in 30 years time they're going to write the same carbon diary as a citizen with no carbon in it. And then they'll get a measure of the sheer scale of the task in front of us, which we must address, because if we don't, the consequences will address us. Well put and a powerful call to action to close us out. Um, so it's my task now to wrap up. This is a fascinating conversation. Thank you to all of our panelists. And as our 2020-2021 season of the Yale Development Dialogues comes to an end, we're beginning to plan our series for the next academic year. And we would really love all of your input on the topics we should cover. So when you exit this webinar, you'll be linked to a feedback form. It shouldn't take more than just a few minutes to fill out. And as a thank you, you'll be entered into a drawing for a collection of books by different panelists we've featured over the course of this series, including Dieter's latest book, Net Zero, How We Stop Causing Climate Change. So thank you to all of our panelists and thanks to all of you for joining us.